The Interchange is brought to you by Schneider Electric. So, what's your risk exposure to increasing energy costs? Do you have a plan to lower that risk? Here's one way, a microgrid. A microgrid solution can optimize your distributed energy resources, helping unlock new revenue streams and avoid costly peak demand charges. Now you can reap the benefits of a microgrid with no upfront capital through a new microgrid as a service business model from Schneider Electric. Find out more about how it works at www.schneider-electric.us slash microgrid. Or if it's easier, just follow the link in the show notes of the podcast page. This is The Interchange, conversations on the global energy transformation from Green Tech Media. I'm Stephen Lacey in Boston, and my co-host Shale Khan is out in Berkeley. Hello, Shale. Hey, Stephen. Well, you know, something, something feels different. And in the last couple of years, there's been a material shift in the way that we talk about renewable energy and distributed resources. We've tried to articulate it on this show, but I think it's worth revisiting more explicitly. Because for so long, believers of technologies like wind, solar, batteries, and microgrids have focused on government support. How should we help these technologies with very specific targeted subsidies? But all of a sudden, direct subsidies and mandates are diminishing in importance. And one example is um, one that you've given a couple of times, Shale. Uh, It's utility-scale solar, which was almost exclusively driven by state mandates and tax credits and is now in the U.S. being primarily driven by economics. And tax credits are also now on a path of being phased out over the next few years. So we have this proven class of resources that can perform the same function as traditional power plants, often at a lower economic and environmental cost. And these resources are hitting the grid at an accelerating pace. So now people are waking up to this reality, and the conversation is shifting toward markets. How do you put rules in place that fairly value the responsiveness, resiliency, and environmental performance of distributed resources like aggregated batteries, real-time energy efficiency, commercial microgrids, or just conventional wind and solar, both utility scale and uh, distributed? And how do you manage the surge of wind and solar so they don't crush wholesale markets by flooding them with cheap power at the wrong time? So that's the framework we're operating in today. And we're going to have a couple of interviews with folks who perhaps operate on different ends of the political spectrum, but who are coming together in agreement over the need to restructure markets to make them fairer and to accelerate this change that we're undergoing right now. So let me ask you, Shale, um, what do you think about my characterization? Like, do you do you agree that there's this agreement I think it's true to an extent. I think that it's definitely true that there's been a transition among the folks who are promoting renewable energy, wherein wind and solar in particular have become economically competitive. And there's where they're not quite economically competitive today, there's a pretty clear runway toward it. So that was what enabled, for example, the compromise that allowed for the extension and ultimate phase out of the production tax credit and investment tax credit in late 2015. You know, the, both the wind and solar industries were sort of happy to see a phase out as long as they had um, a little bit longer of a runway to get there. And I do also think that it's true that there's been a transition now as we get new types of resources on the grid, whether they be, like you said, batteries or demand response or microgrids, or even new ways to use renewables, that the markets, whether they be wholesale markets or retail markets, were just not designed with these resources in mind. And so there's a push to redesign the markets to allow for these resources to compete. And so that sort of naturally does align with the folks who've been sitting on the free market side for a bit longer and have been pushing things like deregulation and, you know, wholesale competition, retail competition, and so on. So I do think that there's an alignment there now that there wasn't in the past. I'm a little skeptical of the idea that this is a fundamental transformation and that we'll now see political alignment amongst both the the crowd that is 
primarily focused on combating climate change and the crowd that is primarily focused on free market principles in electricity for a really long time. But they happen to align right now, just given where the markets are. And I think that they're coming together in some ways in opposition to the current federal administration, which clearly does not share either of those principles, caring about climate change or espousing free market principles. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Why don't you think it will last? You're suggesting that this is a very temporary thing. I think it'll probably last longer. But is that because there are these fundamental differences between more progressive groups that still probably see tax credits and subsidies as important to you know, helping emerging technologies? Well, I think that it's it's either temporary or it's just sort of training its fire right now on a particular space. So it, I think it's relatively easy to have progressive clean energy groups align with free market think tanks on opposition to the DOE NOPER, to opposition to the idea of guaranteeing cost recovery for coal plants as long as they have 90 days of fuel supply. That, you know, they can easily align in opposition to that. But a place where, for example, um, progressive clean energy groups probably support, but you don't see the free market think tanks getting on board with this, would be things like California mandating 50% or even 100% renewable energy, right? That's, a, that, you know, the free market groups are going to view that as as a mandate. Um, the clean energy groups are going to say, you know, we do think that wind and solar can compete, but we need to push this transition faster than it would happen naturally. And we need to create a space for innovation for all the other technologies that are going to have to emerge as you get to higher penetrations of renewables. And we're going to do that by basically enforcing a, a really high mandate. So while I see the places where there is convergence, I just wouldn't overstate how broad it is. And I wouldn't, and, and you know, I think if you just imagine if we had um, a Democrat in office. Imagine if Hillary Clinton had won the presidency and the types of things that her administration would likely be doing on energy issues. I'm not entirely sure you would see so, so much alignment in that case. You might in some things, like for example, you know, we talked to Norman Bay at this conference last week about um, the FERC storage NOPER, which is not the NOPER that we talk about all the time now, but it was a notice of proposed rulemaking that the that FERC made um, before Norman stepped down as chairman. And that one was basically trying to open up markets to make sure that they are designed with the capabilities and the special characteristics of energy storage in mind. My guess is you're going to find places like that where you can get alignment, but I don't think it's this big, broad repositioning of the political spectrum in energy so that, you know, we end up with kind of universal agreement between those groups. It's important to differentiate the political re response to energy policy from the, um, you know, the way that grid geeks talk about this stuff. And we're going to feature a couple of different interviews in this podcast, one with Lene Shirley, who's the Senior Director of Technology Innovation at the Environmental Defense Fund, and one with Devin Hartman, who's uh, a senior fellow with the R Street Institute, a free market think tank. And they use a lot of the same language. You know, you get the sense that they really are on the same page with a lot of this stuff. And it's it's really when you get into the political sphere that people start using rhetoric that purposely divides. So I actually think that we're a lot more aligned on this stuff than you're giving you're giving credit for. I mean, one thing that I thought was interesting in both of those conversations where, where there clearly is alignment at the moment and that we could probably dig into deeper on a future episode is that they both are looking at Texas as the example of a well-formed electricity market that is is doing good work. And Texas is clearly the most liberalized electricity market in the sense that, you know, it is, there's, there's competition at every level that you basically can create competition within Texas. And both Lene and Devin um, speak very positively about the Texas model. So there may be some alignment in terms of what, you know, the ultimate vision of a market could look like. Well, then let's um, hear from Lene Shirley first. Again, she's the Senior Director of Technology Innovation and Market Adoption at the Environmental Defense Fund. We caught up with her in Austin, Texas, where she was speaking um, about tech commercialization and market reform at our power and renewables conference. So after her panel, we um, went to a back room, sat down and talked about 
um, EDF's take on market reforms and sort of how you integrate technologies into this new framework. And of course, you know, I asked her whether she agreed with this convergence or overlap or however you want to describe it. Absolutely. I think um, you can see in the Texas market how having a competitive environment has been able to uh, accelerate the deployment of wind technologies. Um, Markets uh, create environments where people can compete And I think market-based solutions are absolutely necessary to transform the electricity sector. Do you think that's been a transition though? Is it, has it, it's always been true that markets are helpful, but I think Stephen's premise is that in trying to support and push forward this new suite of technologies, renewables and everything that comes along with it, that there was a focus for a long time on subsidies in order to get them economically competitive in the first place, and that now we're transitioning from the focus on subsidy and incentives to a focus on sort of opening up and redesigning markets to enable them to compete head to head. Are we at that turning point? I think there is definitely a shift happening, and I'm, I, I'm not sure if we're there yet uh, in that, um, you know, while all resources that feed the electric sector have incentives, subsidies, tax breaks, what what whatever you want to call it, um, that renewables are actually um, providing different kinds of value streams that aren't recognized in the markets. And while markets are very important for recognizing uh, the, the physical values for electricity generation, I think um, we, you know, markets currently are missing the uh, environmental values that renewables can bring. Yeah, that's probably the biggest one, of course, figuring out a price on carbon and other pollutants. Um, but of course, we, we are looking at identifying black star capabilities, uh, flexibility capabilities. There are all these capabilities that battery storage or renewables with smart inverters can provide. And we're only now beginning to figure out how you value the, the, those resources. That's correct. We see in many of the wholesale markets and the stakeholder meetings efforts to try to create more granular products that can actually help integrate more renewables and distributed energy resources. However, we also see that the stakeholder process is very heavily favored towards incumbents, and it's still very difficult to create those kinds of changes that could be necessary to help release these technologies more fully into the market. How do you see that playing out? I've heard that a lot and and seen it a little bit in terms of these stakeholder processes really being weighted toward the incumbent. And people talk about it a lot, especially in like regulatory conversations where utilities have so much they're overweighted in terms of their power that they have to influence their regulators. But in general, how do you see that uh, advantage of for the incumbents play out in these stakeholder processes? Well, I, I think the stakeholder processes could be balanced. I think one of the issues is that I think the new technologies are outnumbered. Um, they don't have the resources to have a dedicated person sitting in all of the different stakeholder meetings to affect the change. So many times, a lot of players are not at the table. And therefore, when you have a vote, you get outvoted. And that is what we're seeing in ERCOT with the fast frequency response service that probably will die this week. Um, Because while there are people who are supporting it, there are more people who are not. And so I also think that Utilities have had long-term relationships with regulators, and in many cases, there's political connections. And I think, uh, again, when you start looking at and looking at donations to different campaigns from utilities, you can start to see a trend where these connections, you know, actually um, are, are making a difference in some of the decisions that are getting made. What I heard you hint at earlier is that. There are also all these historic subsidies that have favored incumbent technologies. We focus a lot on wind and solar tax credits, which are now being phased down. Um, But there are also other technology-specific tax benefits for coal and natural gas. um, And nuclear. And and nuclear. Uh, Can you walk through some of those and, and why you believe we're missing the mark when we're not addressing those holistically when talking about tax benefits? Well, I think... You know, the argument has been that uh, because it's not an electricity generator 
directly receiving that benefit that it is not affecting the electricity sector. And I, I think that's, that's, that's mistaken. Any input that goes into the production of electricity um, and that receives a, a, any form of tax break or special incentive should, we should acknowledge the fact that that's actually happening. And I think my heartburn is when we focus on the ITC and PTC, but we fail to focus on the fact that both coal and natural gas have received enormous amounts of subsidies, whether it be through the the below market rates for land, below market rates for transportation, uh, the you know the ability to not claim a certain level of production for tax purposes. All of those affect the price of the actual fuel going into. The generator, and so I think it's very important to recognize that that we have been subsidizing our electricity generation for decades, in some cases a century, and that it is uh, it's easy to do the math on ITC and PTC, and therefore I think they get picked on a lot. It's much harder to dig through the actual tax incentives that are received by these other entities. And so, again, I think, um, you know, the subsidies conversation is one that needs to, uh, if you want to talk about those, let's let's talk about all of them. Travis Kavula, a, a Montana PSC commissioner and, and thinker that I really like about these issues and somebody who like truly believes in free markets, wrote this long piece a few months ago called There Is No Free Market for Electricity. And one of the things that I've been trying to grapple with as I think about these transitions is we we simultaneously seem to want to open up the markets more, especially for these new technologies and make sure that they are appropriately rewarding all the attributes that that renewables and distributed energy have. But at the same time, as he points out, you know, electricity is like the most twisted version of a free market you can possibly imagine. Should we be trying to just kind of nibble around the edges like I think we are doing to enable these resources to play in what is already a really messed up market? Or should we be thinking holistic? redesign of electricity markets? Well, it would be nice to think holistically about how do we redesign the markets. I'm not sure if he's specifically referring to all markets. I happen to be biased being based in Texas and seeing the benefit of having no capacity markets. That has allowed a lot of retirements that I think, you know, again, when you look at other markets, they have a glut issue, a a complete oversupply issue, and they have these capacity markets continuing to build upon that. I do think that there are some fundamental flaws. Um, I do think that, you know, we've done a pretty good job um, for most of the markets. And I think, you know, again, uh, if we could start over, it would be great. I don't know exactly how we would be able to do that. Do you think the Texas model is is a model that should be replicated? And for anybody who's not familiar, do you want to just explain what makes Texas different from most other electricity markets? Yes. So... Um, I I do think the Texas model is unique in that it seems to be working well. Um, The the Texas, the ERCOT market basically does not have capacity markets. Um, They have looked at what are those price signals that can be built into the energy markets so that you can inspire investors to come to the market. So for example, we have a $9,000 megawatt hour price cap. So Prices could spike that high, and uh, no other no other organized market has that kind of market signal. Um, one of the things, while while Texas does have a healthy reserve margin, um, well, that's actually changing now that we have the uh, coal plant retirements. But um, you know, you look at other markets that have capacity constructs, and you know you know, those consumers are paying a lot more in that market than they need to because there is an oversupply and they are paying for resources that never get utilized. Right. And just to be more clear about this, the capacity market is a payment to generators for a certain amount of power capacity that they could bring online during a peak period. And oftentimes those generation units don't get utilized, but they get the capacity payments. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting way that we've ended up 
developing these electricity markets wherein so in a, in a typical electricity market not true of texas you'll have an energy market that for which you are paid you know dollars per kilowatt hour at any given time that you're generating but it won't allow prices to spike like crazy and then utilities need to and grid operators need to guarantee that they're going to have sufficient capacity online years in the future so they run a capacity market which is saying you know, right now for 2019 or 2020, 2021, um, if you can guarantee me a certain amount of capacity, then I will pay you for that, regardless of whether I end up calling upon you to generate or not. And so as a result, it, it has complicated the market everywhere else a lot more than Texas, which is really simple. It's just an energy only market. Prices fluctuate a lot more, so you can have those really high price spikes. Um, but in exchange for that, it provides enough of a price signal to generators that they know they can make money so they don't need capacity payments in order to come online. Do you think that that changes, though, as renewable penetration grows? I mean, the worry is that renewables have zero operating costs and are not dispatchable. So if you end up with renewables that are generating at what otherwise would have been the scarcity pricing hours in Texas, then you no longer have that those really high price spikes, which have been a big factor in what makes money for all the, the generators that are online. Do you think that the market, the energy only market in Texas just kind of naturally reaches equilibrium uh, with increasing penetration of renewables or does that pose a threat of some kind? I, I actually think it does. Um, I, I think it'll still work with increasing penetration of renewables. I think when you see prices and the prices continue to drop, you, you see traditional generators crying out for we need to fix price formation and you know again the reality is is that when you have a a resource that has zero fuel costs you'll eventually get a zero marginal cost and you have zero marginal units and i think you know again there's a real opportunity i think for um the markets to continue to succeed in this environment. Now, I think that there needs to be changes, and I think that there's lots of opportunities for ancillary service improvements, and that's a big conversation we're having in in regions that have high penetration of renewables. Um, I also think that we're fixing issues about dispatchability, and that when you start listening to some of the panelists that have been at this conference, um, there are technologies out there that will enable them to become more dispatchable, and uh, I think you know, again, storage is obviously one that that gets talked about a lot, but but there are others that are are um, coming online. So I think when you start looking at solving some of those problems uh, that have originally, you know, grid operators have originally encountered when integrating renewables, um, the ability to forecast when those renewables are available and not has dramatically improved. And you know, again, I think. Um, we're, we're not far from seeing most systems be d- dispatchable in some form or another. We're seeing a lot more traditional free market groups come out in support of these changes to, to rules to, to level the playing field for this broad range of distributed resources that can provide services that are brand new. When you look at some of these groups that may have been on the opposite end of the spectrum, is there agreement among an organization like EDF with uh, maybe traditional conservative groups? Well, yes, actually. You know, EDF has a tagline called Finding the Ways That Work. And one of our main focuses has been really working with businesses to understand the business need in order to create solutions that have environmental impact. And so we have taken market-based approaches in many sectors of our work, and that, that, that's no different than in the energy space. And recognizing, again, utilities need to make money. We need to have our power. Uh, there are opportunities to uh, create a competitive environment where all resources that can deliver the capability that's needed can compete. So EDF has had a long tradition of market-based solutions. And I think, you know, again, um, we find ourselves um, in, in most cases in agreement with a lot of the conservative organizations. You know, principally speaking, um, you know, we like to find uh, solutions, including PACE financing, where you're using private sector dollars to, you know, deploy more efficiency in renewables. Um, there are a lot of opportunities that that 
we environmentalists and conservative groups actually agree on. And I think competitive markets is certainly one of them. Um, to what extent can we make markets tech neutral? Shale talked about how distorted markets already are. Um, like how far can we take this tech neutrality theme? Well, I think we have to look back at how we originally got started. We, we built markets based on what we knew at the time. And so we have a legacy condition that we, we have to figure out how to overcome. And so while I do think that, you know, there are certainly challenges in doing that, I think, you know, the question becomes, what are the changing needs of society? And, you know, how do you incorporate those different needs into a market design and, you know, again, we, we see different elements happening in different markets, including how can you create a carbon adder into a wholesale electric market? And, you know, again, I think, you know, those are some interesting um, opportunities, uh, but, but we do have to unwind the legacy that we've created based on what we knew when we first started designing markets. Lene Shirley, thanks so much. Thank you. The Interchange is brought to you by Schneider Electric. Are you considering a microgrid to improve your facility's resiliency, efficiency, and sustainability? If so, it's important to engage a trusted partner like Schneider Electric to help you meet your energy goals and your budget. Schneider Electric will guide you through the most important questions. How would your business and employees be impacted if your facility lost power for a week or more? Are you maximizing your distributed energy resources to unlock new revenue streams and avoid costly peak demand charges? Do you need an easy way to report on your sustainability performance? Microgrids are a natural extension of Schneider Electric's 100-year legacy in the power distribution and energy management business. Learn more about how Schneider Electric is developing new technologies, financing models, and partnerships to maximize your microgrid investment. Go to www.schneider-electric.us slash microgrid. That's www.schneider dash electric dot us slash microgrid or just follow the link in the show notes of your podcast player or on the website um so when we came back from austin texas we were still thinking a lot about these subjects and we connected with devin hartman who has been doing some pretty excellent work at the R Street Institute. The R Street Institute is a somewhat new uh, free market think tank in the last five or six years or so. And they have increasingly looked at energy policy and put together some um, very thoughtful pieces on electricity choice, um, on wholesale market reform, on tax reform, uh, early in they were an early proponent of uh, carbon tax. And so, you know, we sat down with Devin and, and wanted to get his take on um, what kind of reforms R Street Institute would like to see and what fair competition and free market competition in this very regulated market actually looks like. I wanted to hear Devin's take on our framing as well. And, you know, he largely agreed that there is this coming together from groups across the spectrum. And interestingly, we didn't talk about this, but uh, our Street Institute is working with some more moderate groups on the left, like EDF, um, to kind of put, put together some proposals that uh, open up competition in electricity markets. I think there definitely is. I think it really, you can trace it back to two or three years ago. Um, you know, look what happened when uh, industry and folks on the left and right uh, agreed to, you know, approach tax credits differently for, for renewables. Um, you saw some recognition early in 2015, I think, of that. And I think it's a, it's a combination of a few technological and economic fundamental factors coming up. Um, no longer are we playing the, the nascent industry um, card so strongly. And instead, we're seeing, hey, you know, we, we see a platform in the future um, for clean energy technologies to compete on their merits. So let's have that conversation um, and I think you're seeing folks both on the industry side as well as across the political spectrum um, recognize that competition is good in and of itself just for economic development, um, as well as recognizing as driving the type of innovation and rapid platform turnover um, that will usher in a new age of lower cost, lower emissions power. Can I just ask you, you know, I, I do think it's true that especially you mentioned the sort of tax credit. So what ended up happening is that in the, the um, 
the extenders bill in 2015, there was an agreed phase out to both the PTC and the ITC that everybody seemed pretty happy with. And so that was pretty bipartisan. But would you have supported the same thing happening five years earlier? Because I think that the reality was that the reason that the industry, wind and solar industries were willing and happy to have a conversation about a phase out was that they had received sufficient support for long enough that the technology had matured and gotten cheaper. And now there was a, a clear sort of roadmap to being able to compete without the tax credits. But you know, if you're sort of a, a pure free marketeer, you might have been opposed to having those tax credits for as long as they did exist, where I think the renewables folks would say, no, they needed to be there as long as they have been, and now is the time to phase them out. Correct. Yeah, I, I, I think there was obviously a split between some opinions on the, the left and the right. Um, you know, a lot of folks on the left, uh, you know, have had a tendency to, um, you know, to want to use different forms of industrial policy to, to try and get some, some technologies, especially, you know, the infant industry argument, um, I think, played up strong on that side. Um, but also on the more conservative side, there's the, the perspective, I think, some, some acknowledgement that, again, there are some things like learning by doing and spillover benefits that exist. But the concern over government failure and setting a precedent of picking winners outweighs the correction of those market failures. And so I think that's where you kind of have the principled um, evidence-based disagreements uh, within that range of, of reasonableness. Um, but either way, that argument, um, the infant industry argument, started to wane. Um, and, and now we've seen, um, not just at the utility scale, but especially at the distributed level, there's an increasing recognition that if you want to send uh, the right signals for dispersed market participants uh, to engage in this space, it's going to be harder to do that with, with a more of a monopoly-regulated construct. Uh, you need to facilitate open access uh, to the to the transmission system and and price signals should be the uh, the ultimate uh, you know driving force of which units retire which units come online where they're located etc. You know I do I think actually you hit on one thing that is definitely an area of convergence which is kind of the unease about the regulated monopoly structure that we've got and the regulatory compact for utilities you you see that obviously in these fights over rooftop solar and all these different states and um you know you saw some agreement between the green tea party that popped up and and the rooftop solar advocates so i do think that's an area where you you see some agreement that like something needs to change but i still i go back to you know on the the infant industry bit you know my worry is that if we if we say, look, the infant industry thing worked for wind and solar for a while, we don't have to think too hard about whether we agreed on it that whole time, but we agree now that wind and solar don't need the same kind of, we don't, they don't need the tax credits at least, and they just need to be able to compete in an open field. I think that's great, but I worry that there's going to be a next suite of technologies that are necessary to continue the energy transition. So energy storage being an example, an obvious example of that, that I would argue are still more immature and do warrant some, the, the kind of infant industry support that wind and solar received. So I wonder if we're sort of making a devil's bargain here. Yeah, I think, I think we can see, a, well, there's some lessons learned from applying it to prior technologies. I think even a lot of the, uh, the wind industry folks, for example, will acknowledge you know, yes, we've been making <laughs> that argument was being made 20 years ago uh, for the PTC. This industry has long since grown up. And of course, then you have, um, you know, what economists would say, what started off as rent seeking behavior um, through the lens of the infant industry argument became rent maintenance behavior <laughs> later on, right? The infant industry hasn't quite grown up yet. Um, and you saw some of those arguments trying to pervade, even though obviously they'd, they'd achieved economies of scale already. And so I think some of the lessons learned going forward will be, yes, that was an expensive way to get these technologies out there. Um, I think you'll still have folks that are always in the camp of saying, no matter what, we still need to uh, provide uh, even out-of-market uh, incentives uh, as well as in-market incentives for the development of these technologies. And I think you see that with you know, things like offshore wind and um, you'll see it with energy storage for sure. But I think we are having a different layer of, of conversation where even the big industries, right, even wind and solar, for some of their technology subsets that are more at the infant stage, they're acknowledging that there are problems uh, with, with kind of just doing the mandate and subsidy approach 
um, and some of the costs that are incurred with that. And if you look at something like the Energy Storage Association, their, their number one objective is to make sure that their technologies are appropriately compensated. And that means that gets into questions of, of markets, of market design, of the regulatory construct. Uh, that's not really getting into the, the territory uh, per se of, of tax credits and, and other out-of-market supports. I think that's actually a really good example and one that represents this convergence because you have these advocacy organizations that may have historically just focused on blunt subsidy instruments that are now pushing very specific market tweaks to um, un- enable their technologies to compete. And of course, ESA would say, you know, we need promotion programs in different states and they're, and they're, they're still pushing various targeted subsidy programs, but th- their broad approach really is all about market access, as you described. Exactly. And that's, and that's a huge thing. And I think what better indicator right now than looking at the, the effect of large consumers. So look at like corporate procurement of renewable energy, for example, which has just skyrocketed the last three years. It went literally from just this marginal driver of anything four or five plus years ago to all of a sudden being a big player. So all of a sudden you see the, t- the big tech companies, Walmart and other retailers, um, and even a fair number of uh, industrials and manufacturers, uh, many of them are saying, hey, we just want access uh, to competitive markets. We just want to be able to choose our source of energy supply. Um, and in many cases, that is going with green energy. But in many cases, um, for example, heavy industry, many times it's like, yeah, I'm indifferent. I just want it cheap. and I just want a lot of flexible options. And so you're seeing a lot of push for retail choice. And so whether that's, uh, you know, third party, you know, power purchase agreements, you're seeing a big push for that in a lot of states. Um, And a lot of that is driven by a lot of the inherent um, inefficiencies uh, and and choice constraining um, limitations of the of the monopoly model. And so I think that's a big area. And we're seeing this very cool alignment of the folks that the folks that just don't really care about environmental effects and the folks that are totally green-minded are both coming together and saying, you know what, markets are the way to go. If the private sector wants to put their money um, behind voluntary investments in clean energy, more power to them. And that's something that principled conservatives um, and folks on the left uh, can can totally get behind. So that comes back to, I guess, this sort of the the issues around the regulated monopoly that we have with utilities. Do you have a vision of what the utility of the future should be? Like what, you know, your destiny, if you dial back, it's, it's monopoly on retail sales, you dial back, you know, any other sort of non-free market oriented principles that you can, you still have, it's somebody has to run the lines and wires. And for all the reasons that we originally made utilities monopolies, it doesn't make sense to have multiple sets of wires crossing. So is, is your sort of ideal version of an electricity market like Texas fully liberalized, but you know, there's a central grid authority or does it look something different? You know, I think this is, there's, there's the perspective with today's technology and then there's the perspective I think that we need to keep in mind that we have a regulatory construct that ages well as technology progresses. And so what works today, what's best today with today's technology may not be what's best, say, in the late 2020s or 2030s. And given how slowly regulatory reforms occur, uh, right, the whole 2000s took uh, for, for a generation uh, 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 restructuring just to get those uh, competitive markets upstream going took the better part of a decade or more. And so we have to keep in mind that option value. So I would say with today's technology, um, the, that restructuring as conventional 